Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever the case may be in your area of the world. This is Transfer Pricing Associates in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and we welcome you to today's webinar entitled Shaping the Tax Future of Multinational Corporations with Operations in the Latin and Caribbean Region. Our presenter today is TPA's Heberth Kavara. Heberth is a manager transfer pricing specialist at Transfer Pricing Associates in Amsterdam. Heberth has worked for big four consultancy firms in the United Kingdom and Mexico, participating as a transfer pricing manager since February of 2011. And here is Heberth. Thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, as you all know, Nowadays, we're moving into an era of transparency. This transparency has been called upon tax authorities, citizens, countries, and it has to do with the fact that in the view of the tax authorities, in the view of, uh, of the citizens, corporates are not being transparent enough on the income that they report for tax purposes. We have, for instance, the OECD and the BEPS report, the 15 action plans. We have also the EU initiatives for the extractive industry, calling to be more transparent in, the, in companies operating in the oil, gas, and mining. We have the base of four requirements. We have the financial and accounting reporting standards. And, we, and in, in the case of the U.S., we have the Dodd-Frank Act. All of these are just initiatives that, again, are calling upon an era of transparency. These initiatives are being developed by the OECD member countries and by, con by developed countries. But most of the questions that I have from my clients are, but what's happening in Latin America? Is there anything that I need to be aware of? Or can I still practice the same country-by-country uh, -country approach that I've been doing for the last years? I'm sorry to tell you, everyone, that that's not the case. You cannot approach Latin America the same way you have been doing over the last years. And that's what I'm here. I'm here to tell you how can you shape your future. First, I would like to start by defining by shape. What does shaping mean? Shaping, if we look up in the dictionary, it says to give defined form. In order to give the fine form, you first need uh, the raw materials. What exactly are you going to shape? Secondly, you need the tools to shape it. And then you need the skills and technique, technique to do it. The concepts of this presentation will be to provide you with the raw materials, with the tools in order to shape the raw materials, as well as the skills for shaping the raw materials. For this, I have divided the presentation into four sections. We have the purpose and benefits of this presentation. We have a second section that is called the awakening of the banana republic, where basically I provide the raw materials, all the information that you need to know about Latin America and the Caribbean in order for you to start shaping your tax future. Finally, we have a TPA's approach that will assist you in shaping your tax future. If we move on to the next slide, Speaking about the purpose and benefits of this presentation, I would like you to picture the following scenario in order for you to understand more the context of, of the context and purpose of my presentation. Let's assume that uh, tomorrow morning the board of directors wakes up, reads at the newspaper, turns on the TV, and suddenly there is a news about uh, your company. According to the news, you're not being a good corporate citizen you're being called for tax evasion, low wages in Latin America, allegations of bribing tax officials. All in all, let's call it transfer pricing issues, international taxation. How will this impact the, con the company? How is your company going to react? Well, first, starting by the board of directors, the stockholders and stakeholders, they're not going to be happy with those news. They certainly want to be in control and they want to know what's happening in the company. So 
they're going to call most likely the CEO, of, the CFO, or the CEO. They want to know a response. Are those allegations accurate? Why are we really in control? Let's be honest. The CFO is not managing international taxation, and is certainly not managing transfer pricing. All he does is maximizing the profits of the company, reducing costs, controlling expenses. So the CFO is going to look up to his left, and next he's going to look to the tax director. He's going to ask for qu questions. Are we really evading taxes in Latin America, or are we really paying our fair share, especially when it comes to uh, intercompany transactions? The tax director, his role is not looking at transfer pricing. That's why he has his transfer pricing manager, in case the company has an in-house department. So the tax director will call his in-house transfer pricing manager and ask for a question. Are we really in control in South America, the Caribbean? Well, the in-house manager has a thousand and one things to do on a daily basis. He doesn't only arrange uh, the region of South America and the Caribbean. He goes for Asia, he goes for North America, he goes for Europe, he goes for Africa. When we call to South America, there are more than 22 countries. Most of these countries require that taxpayers prepare on an annual basis a transfer pricing report, as we're going to see it later during the presentation. Reviewing more than 22 reports, having 22 different advisors in different countries, uh, having different stories about the functions and risks and assets performed by each of these countries, as you can see, the story doesn't sound very well. It is an endless world in South America on how to approach transfer pricing. Sometimes there is actually inconsistency on how the transfer pricing is approached in Latin America. The transfer pricing manager has to have conversations with the local advisors, most of them asking the same question about the same transaction. If we look again at this scenario, starting from the bottom down, that means that the in-house transfer pricing manager is most likely not in control of the situation in Latin America. Perhaps the local advisors have made a review of the, trans of the intercompany transaction and his report indicates that there is no risk. However, that doesn't mean that it's really on a risk. And I'm going to tell you later why not. He's going to go back then the in-house transfer pricing manager to the tax director saying, I don't think I we are really in control. You have to ask me about a specific country, about a specific transaction. At that time, the CFO is calling every single uh, hour the tax director saying, are we really in control? What's going to be the answer of the tax director? Well, we're partially. Uh, give me some time. I don't know. It looks like there are some inconsistencies. The advisors on each country differ on their opinion. What's the CFO going to report to the board of directors and the stockholders? Well, I'm not going to keep uh, talking about the nightmares, and then I'm going to talk to you more about the solutions. The purpose and benefits of this presentation for you is, first of all, I'm not going to talk anything about technicalities in the transfer pricing world. If I look at the number of people registered for this event, 20% are transfer pricing managers, transfer pricing in-house managers, whereas 80% are actually in the role of CFOs or CEOs or tax directors. So in order for me to promote the, the regional solutions that you need to uh, be aware of, my approach is going to be talking about the interrelation, about regional, what are the regional, the political, economical, and administrative factors that should influence how to approach transfer pricing and international taxation for the Caribbean region. There's not going to be any more country by country uh, discussion on this on this presentation. So if you're expecting for me to discuss the technicalities or the background of transfer pricing in law per country, that's not going to be the case. I'm going to talk to you more again about a holistic approach, a regional approach. I want to provide you the raw materials again. The raw materials means the background of Latin America. I want you to provide you the tools, and I want to provide you the technique. In the end, after this presentation, you should be able to identify that it is possible to do a regional solution. It should be mandatory and it should be the only way to move forward. Why? Because if we look at it from a CFO perspective, the CFO wants to reduce the, the, the cost for preparing documentation for, in this case, Latin America and the Caribbean. Our regional solutions can do that. 
Then we're going to focus on only those countries where really required transfer pricing documentation and where the higher risk of an audit are in place. Also, I'm going to show you how can we be more consistent about the documentation prepared for intercompany transactions, looking not only at the economic reality, which is most of what the transfer pricing advisors do, but also looking at interrelation with the legal reality, which is any relation with intercompany agreements. And then we're going to look also at the financial and accounting reality, which is what your books and your balance sheet are showing, and that's the information that you first disclose to the tax authorities. So we, in order for us to come up with a regional solution, again, we need to always take, in, take into account all these financial realities. Moving to the next slide, it has been called the Awakening of the Banana Republic. Why the Awakening of the Banana Republic? Well, uh, I once read an article that was addressing each of the countries in the Latin America region and Caribbean as countries just in charge of uh, the production of bananas. So they were referred to it as the banana countries. Uh, when I first read about it, I was a little bit in shock that uh, still nowadays uh, so, such uh, adjectives can be used to refer to some countries. But I wasn't impressed. If I look at 25 years, at the last 25 years, most of the Latin American countries, as we're going to see later, they were not really into international taxation. They really didn't have any experience on international taxation, and certainly not on the world of transfer pricing. There were a few countries where, that were pioneers, and we're going to see it later, but the rest of the countries were falling far behind the developed world. So, what I'm here to tell you is that these individual banana uh, countries are, are getting more integrated, are working closer between them, are working closer with all the developed countries. So these silos of bananas, of banana countries, are turning up into a banana republic, one single region that demands one single approach, one single solution. To narrow down the countries that I'm referring to as part of, of, this, uh, of this presentation, there are 26 Latin American uh, and Caribbean countries, and you can see that on this slide. The, those highlighted in orange are those countries that have no transfer pricing documentation in place or requirements, or there's nothing in their tax law related to transfer pricing. So we're going to focus more on the rest of the countries, those that are not highlighted. In the case of Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico, you will see that they are far developed in the world of international taxation and transfer pricing and perhaps should be used as reference for approaching these, uh, your solutions for Latin America. I was once reading um, a report prepared in 2011 by the European Commission and the European Parliament with, uh, with assistance of, uh, of an accounting firm, and it had to do with the framework of preconditions. The framework of preconditions is in order to implement a solid transfer pricing system, what are the preconditions that each country should have? And there were three preconditions uh, acknowledged in this report. First, we have the economic and political preconditions, which uh, specifically are economic growth, diversification of an open economy. Then we have the legal preconditions. Is there a, pro a comprehensive income tax law, a tax treaty network, a transfer pricing legislation? And finally, we have the, tax the role of the tax administration, which is, do they have the expertise in order to perform a reviews on an international taxation basis and transfer pricing basis? Uh, these three preconditions, according to the report, will determine the extent of development for each country in order to assess international taxation and transfer pricing. If I look at how these three preconditions apply to the Latin America region and Caribbean, I must admit that we're certainly not developed, but we're certainly not the lowest anymore. And I'm going to show you later why. We're a little bit in between, but we're certainly progressive in the area of Latin America and the Caribbean. When we're looking forward into the presentation, I ask you to bear in mind these three preconditions so that you will identify the, the close interrelations be between the preconditions and why Latin America is approaching international taxation the way they are doing now. Framework on preconditions, understanding the Latin America approach. 
As I noticed in, this, in the previous slide, uh, the preconditions are depending on the political view, the legal view, and the tax authorities' rule. In the case of uh, Latin America, only two countries are OECD member countries, which means that they are not abide to what the OECD says. Those two countries are Mexico and Chile. That means that out of the 22 countries that really have some transfer pricing documentation or legislation in place, only two may abide to the OECD, and still those two, one has its own rules. And the rest uh, of the 20 countries, they are a little bit in between. Some of them follow the OECD models, uh, some, some follow the UN model, and some follow their own approach or a different model. And expansion of taxation in the Latin America region has been increased. Uh, now there is taxation of dividends in some countries. Before, that wasn't the case. Uh, the, the, the reduction of tax exemptions is also happening. And this is just one way on, uh, that, on how governments and tax authorities are trying to collect more taxable base. 30% of the countries, of the, 20, of the 22 countries uh, under analysis, they have some transfer pricing principles. That should already tell you that in, if you ever get into a transfer pricing audit, 30% of them will have some sort of explanation of what the transfer pricing framework is in their country. The remaining will not. So that means that the tax authorities may use their advantage position to dictate what transfer pricing is about and how to prove that whether a transaction is or is not at arm's length. If we look at the period 2000 to 2012, corporate, incomes, corporate income tax was one of the main contributors of, uh, of the ratio between taxation and GDP. It wasn't really VAT. So that means immediately that tax authorities across Latin America are increasing their, um, their efforts to tax the, the profits of corporations. It's not going to be VAT anymore. It's going to be corporate income tax. So what you can expect in the following years is for the tax authorities in Latin America to become more strict on their regulations and start taxing more profits somehow the corporate, of the corporates. We also have that 75% of, the, uh, of all the staff uh, that has to do with transfer pricing, only 75% uh, only of that have some exposure to transfer pricing and international taxation. That means that they are growing. If we look five years ago or 10 years ago, that number was close to 30%. Now it has more than double, which means that tax authorities across Latin America, they're getting every year closer and closer in line with the, uh, with the international standards of transfer pricing. They are certainly becoming more familiar with transfer pricing cases all around the world. The expansion of the internet and communication has allowed them to be more, in, uh, more knowledgeable of uh, how transfer pricing is approached in other countries. So again, if you're still thinking that your country-by-country -country approach, which is preparing documentation for each country without looking at the interrelation of, those, of, of the documentation prepared for each country and how it relates with other countries and how it relates with what the uh, headquarter is doing, I think we're not following the right approach. What motivated the, the, uh, the awakening of the Banana Republic? Well, uh, as you know, Asia is becoming one of the largest markets in the world. So tax authorities across Latin America have acknowledged that they're falling behind them. So they certainly want to change how they're approaching transfer pricing, which means that they're not going to be more flexible in order to, be, uh, to enter, uh, to um, invite for foreign direct investment. There is already foreign direct investment in the region. What they're really going to try to do is uh, be become stricter on how the application of the law is in terms of international taxation. The evolution of transfer pricing in other countries, like in India and China, if we take it as good examples, India is so every month, every week, there's always a transfer pricing case, so, which means that they're go just Latin America may actually follow what the Indian tax authorities are doing in China. Why? Because the Latin American countries have seen the benefits of, the, of having a more proactive role in the area of transfer pricing. Then we have the evolution of globalization, financial instruments, technology, business structures. Companies are becoming more complex, and tax authorities in Latin America are acknowledging that without a significant investment in training people, in, uh, in taking part of, uh, of all this evolution, they're falling apart. 
They cannot follow this, uh, this complex structure, financial uh, instruments. Transfer pricing in, uh, financial transfer pricing in Latin America is not really strong. Uh, the technology, the e-commerce, we all know that the BEPS report is, one of the, is, is also addressing the, uh, technology issues. Well, what's going to happen in Latin America? And finally, globalization. Information is flowing every single day. Whatever is known in Europe is going to be known all around the world. In South America, if they start to acknowledge that there, there is a way for them to collect more taxable revenues because a company in the headquartered outside of Latin America is reporting a lot of profits, it is most likely that they will start looking at the books. We also have tax fraud within the same state. Well, what I mean by that is that some, con some multinational companies have a, a group of subsidiaries in the same country. In the beginning, uh, the, the transfer pricing legislation in Latin America was focused more on transactions between uh, uh, a subsidiary and, and uh, foreign-related parties. And now what is happening is that even transactions between related parties in, in this, within the same country are part of the scope of transfer pricing analysis. Finally, we have the declarations of the G20 with respect to, again, the BEPS report, more effective tax system, and the prevention of erosion of national tax revenues. Most of the Latin American countries are certainly not part of the G20, but what they do acknowledge is that if the G20 start to act upon their initiatives, they're going to start collecting more taxable revenue, and the rest of the Latin American countries are start falling apart. So they're not going to let that to happen. They're going to start becoming more proactive again, and so most of them perhaps enacted their own laws, which may not necessarily mean that we'll be in line with what the G20, the OECD, and all the developed countries are adopting. Where in Latin America and the Caribbean are the real risk? Well, first, if I, if I raise these questions to the transfer pricing manager, uh, my first question would be, uh, is there a clear transfer pricing system in the countries where you operate? Again, as we have seen before, that's not really the case. Is there a history of transfer pricing audits? Is there public information available on, on transfer pricing audits and what's the position of the tax authorities in, La in Latin America regards to specific intercompany transactions? What is the experience of the transfer pricing team of the tax authorities that uh, undertake the audits? Is there publicly available, available the information uh, that the multinational can use as re could use as reference to support the transfer pricing? What about the OECD and UN uh, and other guidelines? What should I use as reference? Should I use the OECD guidelines as my main point of reference, knowing that only two countries abide to the OECD? Or should I follow more the UN approach? Or can I, or perhaps should I combine my approach? What about the formalities? Latin America is about formalities. It's not too much like in Europe or North America where uh, it's more a developed uh, approach. In Latin America, it's more about registration of contracts. If you have registered a contract that has to do with related party transactions, you're just meeting one of the few form of the thousand formalities that you need to meet. If you haven't done it, in some countries, for instance, if Colom in Colombia, if you don't uh, register with a certain uh, governmental body your intercompany agreements, it doesn't matter if you have a transfer pricing report supporting the, the transfer prices. The fact that you haven't registered any related agreements, the tax authority's position would be you haven't done your homework, and, and because of that, there will be an assessment and there will be penalties. And how about the scope of your transfer pricing report? Do you, have you already identified an index? Should it be just a copy and paste from the master file? Or, or out of all the Latin American countries, is there any that could be used as reference in order to prepare documentation for the rest of the countries in Latin America? The annual documentation. As you all know, transfer pricing managers, in La most of the Latin American countries, transfer pricing documentation has to be prepared on an annual basis. And in some countries, that documentation is to cover every single transaction, from one euro, one dollar, a few cents, to a million. But where should we want to focus? So do we really have to analyze all of them? And if so, how can we do it? A strict deductibility requirements. That's, that's up to the tax managers and tax directors. You know that in Latin America, the deductibility requirements are becoming uh, stricter and stricter. How are you approaching it? Have you identified a way to substantiate and support the deductibility of your requirements? And if you have, uh, is your approach in line with what you're doing for transfer pricing system, uh, documentation, or are there any inconsistencies? 
Finally, we have corresponding and secondary adjustments. Sometimes it is inevitable. Even though you've dumped your homework, you have prepared your transfer pricing report, there is a transfer pricing audit, and the tax authorities are calling up for an adjustment. But then if there's going to be an adjustment to one part, uh, party of the transaction, what's going to do the other party or the multiple parties to the transaction? Do the tax authorities have any, uh, any knowledge on corresponding adjustments? What about secondary adjustments? As we're going to see later on during the presentation, sometimes that is not the case. The process of transfer pricing integration in Latin America and the Caribbean. As I mentioned it to you before, out of these 22 countries that comprise uh, the, the group of, of Latin American countries with some sort of transfer pricing system, there are three main countries that uh, have served as the leading, um, as the leading uh, countries for transfer pricing across Latin America. And we have Argentina, Mexico, and Brazil. Then we have a few others that you can see them uh, in, this, uh, in this picture that are developing and they're somehow integrating to the world of transfer pricing. If you have operations in all these countries in Latin America, this can already tell you that a transfer pricing audit can be expected to be aggressive in, in Argentina, Mexico, and Brazil. Whereas in other countries, because they are moving, they are just integrating into transfer pricing system, perhaps the tax authorities have no, um, no understanding of international transfer pricing. They don't have any strong knowledge on the methodologies, on the type of benchmarks, on the type of economic analysis performed. So this is just one of the raw materials that you need to take into account when deciding where to focus the documentation for transfer pricing purposes and also for international taxation. One of the questions that my clients have are, uh, can I rely on these OECD guidelines for preparing local documentation? Well, again, uh, going back, uh, only two countries are OECD members and the rest none. So if we look at this slide, you can see on the column on the left that only Chile, Colombia, and Costa Rica, uh, based upon our experience, they do follow the, uh, the, the, what the OECD says. Of course, there's going to be some specific country rules, but to, the, to most of the extent, they follow the OECD. But then we have another set of countries, which are the majority. They follow the OECD, but the majority of them are follow their own country references. Are you familiar with those references? Are those references contradicting to a certain extent the OECD approach? If you have prepared a master file from, let's say, a European perspective or a North American perspective, how do you, and yeah, you know, the developed, uh, the, the European companies and uh, North American companies, most of them, they are OECD members. So if you prepare a documentation from an OECD perspective, is it really going to be acceptable in Latin America? How could you be assured of that? Or in which countries should I tailor my analysis in order to make it country specific? Well, we're going to discuss it later. And then we have a third uh, set of uh, one company, which is comprised by one company, which is Brazil. All my clients, whenever we start a discussion about Latin America and the Caribbean, is Brazil. What can I do about Brazil? Well, as you all know, Brazil has its own way of doing transfer pricing. Again, I'm not going to discuss this, the technicalities on how they do it, but is there a way to prepare a master file that, you, that can include Brazilian operations? Well, we're going to find that out later. I want to uh, continue by making a, a very explicit um, assertion, which is there is a big difference between submitting a transfer pricing report and preparing a transfer pricing report. So whenever you decide uh, how should I allocate my time for preparing documentation, there are a few countries that, according to the local law, you need to submit your transfer pricing report along with the tax return or perhaps your financial statements, and you have to do it on an annual basis. That's the case for the countries shown on this slide, which means that the rest of the countries, you have perhaps the obligation to prepare a transfer pricing report, but you don't necessarily have to submit it. So, again, if you need to determine how should I manage my time for preparing documentation for all these countries in Latin America, perhaps you should consider the information that I'm providing here. Maybe you should start with these countries, and for the others, perhaps you can leave them at other point in time. The burden of proof. Taxpayer makes the first move. In which countries do multinational have the multinationals have the burden of proof? Well, as you can see, 
uh, only if we, we look at the column on the left, only four countries, the burden of proof will be on the side of the tax administration. On the remaining, it is actually the taxpayer. And again, this tells us that the columns on the left, you need to prepare documentation perhaps, but it will be questioned by the tax authorities in most cases. Whereas the countries on the right, the burden of proof is on your side. So do you have to prepare documentation? Of course you're going to have to do it. Some of my clients, uh, whenever they do the transfer pricing uh, reports, uh, they've done it again from the headquarters perspective. And uh, usually when they want me to use that, uh, uh, the function and analysis and the company analysis in incorporated in this uh, master file, it is very obvious that it's one-sided. By one-sided, I mean that it tells the story from what the headquarters think is happening in Latin America and the Caribbean. But when I compare it to what is really happening in Latin America and South America after doing some functional analysis interviews, there is a big discrepancy. So that means that the story doesn't fit. One of the parties is not being extremely transparent. If the tax authorities acknowledge that, there is already a risk in our side. In certain, of the, of the, in certain countries in Latin America, it is very common for the tax authorities to perform field audits. These field audits comprise visiting the facilities of the entity. If it is a manufacturing entity, they would like to have a tour around the, 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 the facility, looking at the type of tangible assets used, uh, becoming familiar with the processes, looking perhaps at some manuals, etc., etc. There's only perhaps one country, which is Panama, that again, so far, first of all, is just in the earlier stages of transfer pricing, and it hasn't really commented whether they're up, they up for uh, visiting the facilities of the taxpayer. But as you can see on the column of your left, in Argentina, in Mexico, in Colombia, and the rest of the countries, tax authorities at some point will knock on your door. So for those local transfer uh, tax, uh, tax managers that are part of, the, um, of today's presentation, perhaps you're already familiar with this. Tax authorities will knock on your door and they would like to have a look at what you're doing. So what does this mean in terms of managing your risk? Whenever you prepare transfer pricing documentation for Latin America and the Caribbean, it is advisable that someone makes a field inspection that someone corroborates what is prepared at the central level and try to capture in that central documentation some of the uh, local elements compiled during the field audit. Part of all this um, functional analysis, as you know, ends up being uh, supporting the economic reference that you use for benchmarking purposes. Again, the same story. When you prepare the local the transfer pricing documentation on a on a, on a, a central level and then you want to roll it to the to, to Latin America and the Caribbean, the problem is that the comparables that you have been using are some of the, most of the times not acceptable by tax authorities because they prefer the use of North American databases or North or databases that include information on South American companies. So if you're using Amadeus and the tested body is not a European company about the Latin American company, the chances are that your benchmark is going to be rejected. So, but that's one point. Let's assume that you use a database that is in line with the expectation of the tax authorities in Latin America. Then the question is, have you performed adjustments? Well, the question is, what type of adjustments? Is there a clear indication in the, in the transfer pricing law of that country about adjustments? I'm afraid to tell you that the answer is none. Again, most of these tax authorities, or the way the law is written in these countries in Latin America, is quite broad. They refer to making adjustment to increase comparability, but they never indicate what exactly they mean by adjustments and which type of adjustments should be performed. On this slide, I'm showing you the type of adjustments that are more preferred or applied by tax authorities. Have you taken into account in your central documentation? Why are you just copy and pasting your analysis without making or taking into account this type of adjustments? If your answer is the latter, again, in the event of a transfer pricing audit, most likely your results are going to, are going to show non-arm's length results. Moving on to the next slide, which is uh, about the information exchange between tax authorities. 
A few years ago, I would say 10, 20 years ago, tax authorities across Latin America were working in silos, which means that each country was looking up for just their own interest. Nowadays, they're looking that if they start working closer, if they start working together, and that's one of the, uh, one of the key uh, action plans uh, that, the, that the BEPS report touches upon, which is the information exchange between tax authorities, Latin America is not going to fall behind that. The real, the tax authorities are re, have realized the significant benefit of doing multiple audits. If we, if we refer to this slide, you can see which countries are usually sending requests, so that means that they are exchanging information during the transfer pricing audits, and which others are not following it. I am afraid to say that uh, countries which are more aggressive and where a lot of multinationals have operations are those focused on the left. Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Peru. This again gives you some indication as to making sure that whatever the transfer pricing report, uh, whatever the information compiled in the transfer pricing report for one country, let's say it's Argentina, if that report covers transactions with other Latin American countries, you have to be sure somehow that the information disclosed for Argentina purposes makes sense also for other countries. If I speak from experience, that's not used most of the times, I would like to say 80% of the time, that's not the case. Reports are prepared, again, on a country-by-country -country basis. The local advisor has his own view about transfer pricing. He prepares the report with, uh, with his limited knowledge about the group, about the, the, the group structure and strategies, and comes up with a conclusion. And most of the time, that's con that conclusion does not match what the transfer pricing report for another Latin America country is saying. So again, those inconsistencies are already creating your risk. And if I'm telling you again that tax authorities in the upcoming years are gonna, do the, uh, are gonna follow the exchange of information more frequent, that means that you need to make sure that your stories across all Latin America make sense. They have to be in line in a regional basis, which is Latin America, but also perhaps what you're saying in your global master file. There needs to be consistencies among the stories, among the functions, risk, assets, and analysis. Let's assume that uh, your company has uh, a transfer pricing audit. Then the question is, what's going to happen? What am I facing? What should I expect from this transfer pricing audit? In this slide, you can see how tax authorities allocate their time. I'm afraid to say that uh, most of the time, it's not really on planning for a transfer pricing audit. It's not really about becoming trained on understanding the intercompany transactions on their analysis. Most of the times, it's just, again, the formalities. It's about inspections. It's about visiting your premises and asking and asking and asking for more documents. So if you know already this, then how are you going to approach a transfer pricing audit? Are you going to try to approach it the way you do it in Europe? which is a little bit more open up for discussion. There is a clear communication from the tax authorities on what is expected, information that you need to present, deadlines. Or are you going to just sit and wait and see how the tax authorities in Latin America react? If your approach is the latter, which is just sit and wait, most of the times the conclusion is not going to end up in your favor. And we're going to see later why. If we look at the number of officials uh, that are in Latin America that are dedicated to, transfer, to the transfer pricing field, we can see that Mexico, Argentina, Ecuador, and Colombia perhaps can be seen as the countries with a relatively good number of officials that have some knowledge of transfer pricing. The rest of the countries, they have limited resources. They have limited officials. And most of the time, their knowledge about transfer pricing is also limited. How is this going to interplay with your approach? Well, if you receive an audit in Argentina, Mexico, Ecuador, Colombia, perhaps you need to be more proactive. You need to make sure that you have your documentation in place. You need to make sure that you have your contracts, financial statements, segmented in from financial information. Whereas in the other countries, it may well be that, again, uh, it's more about meeting the formalities. And as we're going to see on the next slide, a 
slide we're going to see later on the next slide, uh, you're going to identify that in some of these countries, because of the low number of officials in, uh, that have to do with transfer pricing, uh, usually they're going to try to conclude an assessment uh, in, in a quite a short time, and it's not going to be on your benefit. So again, you need to take into account in which, this information in order to identify which countries should you, uh, should you prepare transfer pricing documentation first. Which industries carry a higher risk of being audited? Well, if we look at this slide, we can see that there are six industries. Again, because of the nature of the region, you can expect that uh, extractive industries are, are, are audited in a frequent basis. We also know that there's a lot of uh, vehicles being manufactured in Latin America, Chile, Mexico, and Brazil, Argentina, just a few, country, just a few countries to name. They have a lot of manufacturing and distribution operations uh, related to the auto automotive industry. The oil and gas industry, well, we have Brazil, certainly is booming. We, we have Venezuela, and Venezuela is a country that uh, you know, it's trying to become more open and more transparent in terms of how they're doing their transfer pricing audits and, and their audits in international taxation. But most of the cases, they are not, and the, and the taxpayer ends up uh, losing. If you are in any of these industries, again, think about how you're approaching transfer pricing uh, in Latin America. Is there a way to hide? Now I've told you about the capabilities of the tax authorities. I have mentioned how the number of officials and which countries have a significant number of officials with some significant expertise in the area of transfer pricing. But the question is, is there a way to hide? Because perhaps less, you know, if we speak about five, ten years, what, multinational, what some multinationals were doing is, I'm just going to prepare my transfer pricing documentation. I'm just going to copy and paste for the master file. I'm not going to make sure that there are consistencies across all the reports prepared for Latin America. Nowadays, tax authorities are uh, looking at transfer pricing and international taxation on a holistic basis. The a tax, a, a transfer pricing uh, audit may start with transfer pricing, but they're going to make some cross-reference with information provided for customs purposes, also in the annual uh, tax return. Also, with the financial reality, they're also going to look up on the intercompany agreements. And again, if there's exchange of information, all these documents and others will be requested from other countries. Most of the times, there is not consistency in all the reports that are submitted on an annual basis in order to support transfer pricing and international taxation. And you can see here the type of documents or the type of approach that the tax authorities in Latin America follow in order to identify which taxpayers are misbehaving. Well, let's assume that you get another transfer pricing audit. How bad can it be? Transfer pricing, uh, transfer, uh, the tra tax authorities in Latin America, uh, you know, they don't have experience. Everybody's telling me about it. Uh, but how bad can it be? I'm sure that I have a good transfer pricing team in-house. They are expertise people, so they will be able to defend what I'm doing in, in Latin America. Well, if we look at this table, and we took a sample of three countries, we have Argentina, Mexico, and the Dominican Republic. And we look at, two, at the period of 2007 to 2012. As if you can see, more, most of the results show that, uh, that, that in the end, at the end of the audit, the conclusion is not going to be ruled in favor of the taxpayer. It's going to be more in favor of the tax authorities. And let me tell you something, and I'm sure that most of you who have been involved in a, in a tax audit or a transfer pricing audit in Latin America already, you know that once the tax authorities enter into your company, they're not going to walk out without having something in their hands. It is very difficult to win an audit in Latin America. So either you prepare and you try to make sure that your approach is defendable enough so that if you have to go to court, so be it, but you can defend your, your, your case, or you can lose everything. But if you adopt a reactive approach, 
if you are inconsistencies, if you are inconsistent on the way uh, of the documentation is prepared for each country, if you're not making sure that the, the, all the all the reports that you're preparing for customs purposes, for valuation purposes, for legal purposes, tie with what you're saying on your transfer pricing report, it is very likely that you're going to lose the case. So either you can lose everything, or you can just lose a little. In Latin America, it is difficult to win all the time. But again, if you prepare a solid transfer pricing documentation, at least you have arguments for the tax authorities not to do a significant assessment on your, on your taxes. Over the last uh, 40, 45 minutes, I've talked about uh, the background of Latin America and the Caribbean. And pretty much I try to give you the raw materials, what I refer to as the beginning as the raw materials. But now, how, you know, I'm lo let's, let's start looking at the opportunities. With all this information that I have provided, where are the opportunities? Well, one of the uh, opportunities that you have is that in Latin America, uh, except for Brazil, and some of the uh, some of the islands, uh, they speak Spanish. Transfer pricing documentation has to be prepared in Spanish, and in most of these countries, it is mandatory. So if your report is prepared in English, they're not going to accept it. So that means that you can do uh, economies of scale. Perhaps you can prepare one single report that reflects what the group is doing, what the group is doing on a regional basis, and also to reflect uh, what the group is doing on a local basis focusing again on those countries where there is a high risk of being audited or where the tax law is and the transfer pricing law is very strict. Most of the countries, most of the companies uh, with operations in Latin America, those subsidiaries, the, the, their profile is either manufacturers, distributors, or commissioners. They perhaps have different markets. They have been assigned different markets. But if we look at the functional profile, the risk profile, assets profile, most of the times it's exactly the same. So do you really need to prepare a report? Or do you really need to prepare a functional analysis interviews for each of the 22 countries where you may have operations in Latin America? Or can you perhaps define uh, a profile for each of the comp for uh, just general uh, profiles, one for manufacturers, one for distributors, one for commissioners, and then roll it out, roll it down, sorry, to Latin America with some specific factors. But in the end, again, what I've seen from experience is that the, 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 like a multinational company hires a local advisor to prepare a transfer pricing report. So the local advisor uh, has to do a functional analysis interview, a database search, and uh, this is done per country. So again, if you have at least seven or ten uh, companies in South America, and if you have to do all this, when do you know in advance that the functional profile of all these companies is the same? So why hiring different advisors? It just, it, does, it just doesn't make sense. And let me tell you something. If they are not that experienced in the area of transfer pricing, it is very likely that whatever they prepare is going to be inconsistent amongst them and even amongst what you are saying at the central level. So you need to be careful on that. The transfer pricing rules in Latin America, and this is a good news, they're pretty much leveraged from uh, Argentina or Mexico, except from Brazil, of course. But that means that if you take as reference Argentina and Mexico, and perhaps based upon the, the, the transfer pricing requirements in those countries, you prepare the local documentation, there are higher chances that you're already covering the 22 countries. The hierarchy of methods is perhaps one thing that you need to take into account. In Mexico, there is a hierarchy of methods, but not in the other countries. Is that an opportunity? Of course, because Perhaps you, you can prepare uh, documentation again for the rest of the countries and just try to see how can you roll it out to Mexico. If, as you all know, uh, Latin America behaves, uh, the economic cycle, the political cycle are very similar. Again, they are quite intertwined. So when you have to prepare your industry analysis, how different can it be in Latin America or across the Latin American countries? Again, what I've seen from experience is that each advisor will prepare its own industry analysis. Is that really the best way to move forward? I don't think so. Databases. Each of the advisors will run its own database search. The comparables, are they consistent? 
did they accept the same profile? Did they perform the same adjustments? And if they did, how do how do how are they? How is the advice for sure that those adjustments will be acceptable in other countries? So that's a really good question, right? Using the OECD as the key basis, again, if only two countries out of the 22 under a scope are OECD members, what should you use as your point of reference? And if you can use this, how, and if you can use the OECD as your point of reference, how should you do it? What about the lack of experience in assessing, in assessing certain intercompany transactions? As we're going to see later, some of the uh, tax authorities in Latin America have expertise in specific transactions. But when we talk about more complex uh, guarantee fees, financial arrangements, cost sharing arrange arrangements, they don't have any clue. So do you need to spend too much time on the analysis and do, of those type of trans or complex transactions? How complex does your analysis have to be? If you know that the tax authorities in Latin America have no experience, if, you come up, if your analysis is too complex, when presenting that analysis, they're not going to understand it. If they can understand it, again, most likely they're not going to say it's wrong, but most likely they're not going to say, I'm going to win. You're going to lose something again. And that was my point before. In the end, you may lose something. Based upon these last key points and the opportunities that I've raised, how can you save your future then? In order for you to shape your future, I want you to understand these conclusions reached from, uh, from the, what I presented before. You should have a look at Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and perhaps Colombia and Ecuador as high-risk Latin American countries. So try to follow those countries. Try to follow what they do in terms of transfer pricing and international taxations. And to the extent possible, try to replicate their approach to what you're doing for documentation purposes for the rest of Latin America. In the end, they are too connected. As some of you know, there is uh, Argentina introduced the sixth transfer pricing method, which a lot of Latin American countries, uh, which, trans which um, activities in the commodities industries are following it. In fact, some countries outside of the Latin America region are also adopting or exploring to adopt the sixth method as one of the methods to be incorporated into the law. The majority of tax authorities in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, are not as strong in the area of international transfer pricing. Also bear that in mind when you prepare your analysis. How complex do you have to be in your analysis? If your analysis is done at the central level, where sometimes the expertise is, is um, you need to find a way to put it in more simpler words and in a simple approach when it comes to, uh, to be used for preparing transfer pricing documentation for Latin America. Careful with being too sophisticated. Again, it may not work out in your own benefit. If you are too sophisticated in your analysis, uh, in the analysis of licensing of intangibles, cost sharing arrangements, guarantee fees, if you cannot explain it in a simple form to the tax authority in Latin America, again, you may lose the case. Make sure that you carry a field audit when, um, and, that, and the outcome of that field audit is reflected into the uh, master file, whether the central master file or the regional master file for Latin America. Make sure that those key elements are captured there. Otherwise, it is, sometimes it is obvious that the uh, transfer pricing report was prepared at the central level, and again, it's not in line with what is reflecting at the local level. Economic and political, legal and tax administration preconditions that I referred to in the beginning, the majority are the same in Latin America. The economic cycle in Latin America is almost the same. The political cycle is also the same. The legal cycle is also the same. So again, when, you, when preparing transfer pricing documentation for your Latin American operations, do you really have to do it on silo basis, on a country by country, or can you really explore a more regional approach? That's a question that perhaps you want to think about. When it comes to disputes, what are the chances of winning a case? If I refer to the slide addressing that issue, well, it looks like you're not, you don't have high chances to win. Let me introduce you a concept that has been developed uh, over the last year with Transfer Pricing Associates and also with some of our clients, which is the Latin America Master File. This approach, and it's something that you may want to explore in detail, 
how it's, it's about preparing a transfer pricing report that is focused on Latin America and the Caribbean. It's focused on reflecting the reality of the international taxation of the operations of a multinational company in Latin America and the Caribbean. This uh, Pan-Latin Master Fund, that's how we call it, it's, it focuses on the economically significant transactions. So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, cover all intercompany transactions in Latin America, but only those transactions that we know in advance have a high risk either because the transaction is complex in nature, and again, I told you that sometimes being too complex in your analysis is not, is not good. It could be because of the volume of the transaction or the frequency of the transaction, or if the transaction has to do with commodities. Again, that's one of the key areas of expertise of, uh, of the tax inspectors in Latin America. So we're going to focus on the economically significant transactions. You have to identify which is meant by by, by economically significant. The transfer pricing audits in Latin America tend to focus on tangible goods. So again, if, if, we, if in your company, most of your transactions with Latin America countries are in tangible, in, within the tangible aspects, perhaps you need to focus, spend more time on the analysis of those transactions rather than on intangible transactions. Intercompany services, well, perhaps that's not only applicable to Latin America, but to the rest of the countries. Tax authorities don't like to see service charges to Latin America without substance. And trust me, over the last two years, I've seen a significant increase in audits when it comes to intercompany services. Most of these audits start just from taxation. They, uh, they start asking the subsidiary to substantiate the intercompany service charges. And uh, the outcome is that the invoices do not reflect accurately the, uh, the charge. The description is too vague. There's no documentation from the savers provided to uh, support the arm's length nature of the charge. The allocation key me measures are done based upon net sales, which most of Latin America, they simply don't accept it. So again, bear in mind how, you're gonna, uh, how are you approaching the analysis of tangible goods and intercompany services. Like I mentioned it before, when preparing this Pan-Latin masterful solution, Perhaps we should look at Argentina and Mexico as point of reference for preparing the transfer pricing documentation for the rest of the countries. Allowing you to uh, do only one source of reference for preparing local documentation, that's going to help you to be in control. Rather than having documentation for each of the countries in Latin America, which is most of the approach that multinationals are doing now, you can prepare it centrally. By having it centrally, Again, you know what's happening in Latin America as a whole. You, you know what's happening in a holistic basis rather than in silos again. And so that's very important for you. It's going to reduce the time you spend in preparing documentation. It's going to help you to be in control also of what the type of information you're disclosing towards the tax authorities and the stakeholders. There will be consistency in the documentation prepared for Latin America. So even if the tax authorities in Latin America or other countries exchange information, exchange the reports prepared for their own country, they're going to find that the story is plausible, that the story fits in one country or the other, and it also captures the local elements. And that's what you need to bear in mind. Let me explain to you into more detail how does the Pan-Latin America Master File works out. Uh, First, we're going to start with the inputs. If we look at the left side of the slide, we have the input section. Uh, more and more multinationals want to have access to all transfer pricing documentation 24-7, wherever they are located. So now the way things are done is only the, the transfer pricing advisor has control of the report, control of the benchmarks, control of, the, of the, any supporting documentation used to prepare the file. If you ever get the transfer pricing audit, and for some reason the tax audit, the, the, whoever is preparing the transfer pricing report is not available, you're going to have to wait until he gets back and until he finds that information. Now, one of the solutions is let's prepare a virtual e-room where all those documents relevant to defend the transfer pricing report are uploaded into a server. And that server will be used by the multinationals to consult it and to have access 24-7 for any information that was used for preparing the transfer pricing report. The structure of that virtual e-room is comprised into two. You have a central, what we refer to as central modules, which is 
any information that applies to any co any group company, regardless their functionality profile, risk profile, or benchmark or type or activity performed. Then we have some local some local or country specific modules, which is uh, sometimes again the industry analysis has to be specific for Latin America. Well, that's going to be there. If some elements of the industry analysis are specific to certain countries, it's all also going to be captured there. The benchmarking analysis is also going to be part of these local country modules. Which of these analyses will have to be re uh, replicated to which countries? That's in an overview how the virtual e-room works. Once we have that information available, we need to determine when is the timing of preparing the reports. Again, focus on those countries where uh, you are required by law to submit your transfer pricing report. And then you focus on the rest of the countries where the local law prescribes that you need to have some sort of documentation. The format of the transfer pricing report. What should be the scope? Should I follow what the local law says? Or perhaps can I use what Argentina and Mexico prescribe? And based upon their, uh, on that, should I prepare my local documentation? Think about it. We also have developed some risk management tools that you need to also take into account and develop internally, which is a country risk matrix. In this country risk matrix, you need to identify for each specific country what the specific uh, prescription of the law are. For instance, again, in Mexico, the transfer pricing law indicates that you have the, the selection of the transfer pricing method, there is a hierarchy on that selection. That's not the case in, in the rest of the Latin American countries. But you have Brazil. As another example, Brazil, there are only three methods, and it depends whether the transaction is inbound or outbound. So this country risk matrix captures all that information. It is updated annually, or any time there is a significant change in the law. So whenever, at the, at, the, at the beginning of the year, when you have to decide which countries to prepare documentation and, and the scope of, of that documentation, you can refer to that country risk matrix to identify the key elements. We also have the country by country reporting. Uh, to those of you who are not familiar with uh, with this term, uh, the the OECD through the um, action points that uh, have been introduced in order to raise transparency in the tax world, there is a report called country by country, which means it requires a specific information of the operations of all the group and its subsidiaries, uh, but at, at the local level, at the global level. Such information is so, so detailed as uh, what are the withholding taxes paid in a year, interest rates paid in a year, dividends paid in a year, um, and so on. So it's important for you to have a country-by-country country template for internal purposes in order for you to prepare, in, order for you to prepare in, in, in the event of an audit. At some point, this country-by-country country reporting will be turned from an initiative, which is now, that's the status, an initiative, it will be turned into law. And most of the OECD member countries, they will, they will have to adapt it. And those non-OECD member countries, I'm sure that somehow they're going to reflect it in their law. So have you taken an approach for that? Do you know what to do, how to prepare a country-by-country country analysis? Finally, if we move to the output, the output is having a master file. This pan Latin master file, again, is going to help you to prepare the local documentation. And this local documentation will be in line with the master file. The master file for Latin America is also going to be in line with other master files prepared for other uh, regions of the world. What are the benefits of having this type of solution? Well, first of all, reducing money, uh, reducing the cost for preparing it. Uh, I'm sure that that's not the benefit of the tax manager. I'm sure that's the benefit of the CFO. Disclosing a homogeneous and consistent approach. Again, uh, if you look at the, if you if you have a look today or during the weekend, look at five transfer pricing reports prepared for Latin America, prepared by different advisors or even the same advisors. I guarantee you that you will find inconsistencies, especially if you look upon transactions such as licensing, financing. There's just going to be a lot of inconsistencies, and if we also do contract manufacturing, uh, manufacturing distribution. Some of the information contained in those reports may portray the idea that the, that, the, that the subsidiary in Latin America is acting as an entrepreneur. So therefore, if in your global master file prepared at the headquarter level, you're indicating 
that the subsidiaries in Latin America act as low-risk uh, distributors, it's going to be contradicting what is said at the local level. Est apply a standardized approach for assessing the arm length nature. It's always good for you to, um, again, make, try to use to the extent possible the same benchmark, the same uh, economic analysis that you're doing it. Follow it. Uh, focus on countries representing a higher risk. As I mentioned it before, you have Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, Colombia, just to name a few, that represent the risk. Identify and assess on a regional basis your transfer pricing, and not only transfer pricing, but your tax issues. If you have an issue about withholding taxes, if there's a change, if there's an adjustment in the, in the assessment done by the tax authorities on the withholding taxes reported by one group company, that's going to have an effect on, the, on another group company, whoever it was part of the intercompany transaction. Do you know how to, uh, how to tackle that issue? Again, do you know how the tax authorities are going to do that corresponding adjustment? With this, I have reached the end of the presentation. And uh, I would like to open the forum for uh, a, question, a quick question and answer session. I'm just going to review some of the questions that have been introduced by, by the audit, by the attendees. There's a question uh, from one of your from one of our participants. Do you find that Latin American countries also share information with tax authorities outside Latin America or primarily within? It's also outside, and I was working on it works both ways. But at least uh, I was working on a on a case where it was part of a multi audit initiated in Europe. And uh, it had to do with transactions in Latin America. And the tax authorities from at least, uh, it was the Netherlands, France, and Germany, were requesting information from, uh, from Latin America. And, the tax, and uh, the tax authorities in Latin America were cooperating with this information exchange. And in fact, as a conclusion of that audit, the tax authorities from Latin America initiated their own transfer pricing audit. So yes, the answer is yes. It is happening, but also in Latin America. Uh, the countries of at least Argentina and Brazil are working closely together on that. Uh, uh, Uruguay and Argentina, because of the introduction of the sixth method, and our countries seen as heavily involved in commodities, they're also working together. In fact, uh, pretty much the, the Argentinian tax authorities are coaching Uruguay uh, for the assessment, for the application of the transfer pricing, of the sixth transfer pricing method and any transactions that have to do with, uh, with the sixth method. Uh, Hebert, we have a question here. How costly is it to prepare such LATAM master files? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, at least, assuming that the scope of the, trans of the, of the Latin America's master file is between, let's say, 10 countries, that could be between 30,000 and 50,000 euros. And it costs uh, developing the central module, which is any information that applies to the group and the subsidiaries, regardless of their location in Latin America. But we also have the local modules, which is preparing the transfer pricing documentations for those specific 10 countries. Uh, if I compare uh, these solutions against this, the, the silos, which is how, the tax, how most of the multinationals are doing it, um, for three, if, if you quote with the local uh, transfer pricing advisor for the analysis of at least three to five intercompany transactions, they will say that it's between $5,000 and $10,000. So if you multiply $5,000 or $10,000 dollars ten. 10 entities that need to be covered, so that's already $100,000. Is that really what you would like to do? And again, bear in mind that in addition to those costs, you may be exposure, exposed to inconsistencies in your report. So if I have to compare the cost for preparing this global master file, the benefits or even replicating it and updating it on an annual basis, I think it is a really good investment. And what countries should be covered by the LATAM master file? Uh, well, as indicated in the, uh, across the presentation, Argentina is certainly one. Brazil has to, it's a must. There's no doubt about it. Mexico is also a must. Uh, Colombia, uh, Ecuador, Venezuela, 
And uh, in terms of Central America, we have uh, Costa Rica, for instance, and, um, and that's at least uh, the few questions that must be covered in the transfer pricing master file. And what would your estimate be for the time it would take to complete the LATAM master file? Assuming that both the, our clients and, um, and TPA, or even for those who have an, an in-house transfer pricing department, assuming uh, you know, full devotion uh, of efforts uh, on preparing this uh, master file, usually it takes between three to five months to prepare it. Uh, again, that includes performing the benchmarking searches, performing the comparability adjustments, the functional analysis interviews both with the headquarters and also with the local people. So usually it's between three and five months. Why? Because um, in the end, the purpose of this master file is to be used to prepare local documentation. So we, we are fully aware of, uh, of the relevance of preparing it. We usually recommend to start doing these master files at the beginning of the year. So it will be January until May, because uh, most of the, um, most of the tax returns in Latin America have to be submitted at least before June. So if by May we have already the master file and the local documentation, that is a good way for the, uh, for the for clients to just, you know, wherever they have to submit the report, they will submit it. Wherever they have to keep it, just for uh, in case of an audit, well, they can keep it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Heber. Uh, to remind all of our attendees, Heberth may be contacted at the email address on your screen. And we'd like to thank you for attending Transfer Pricing Associates webinar, Shaping the Tax Future of Multinational Corporations with Operations in the Latin and Caribbean Region. We hope you found today's presentation informative. A copy of today's presentation will be available online within the next week, and a link will be provided to you by email. On behalf of Transfer Pricing Associates in Amsterdam, we bid you a good day. <laughs>